Well, good morning, Discovery Church. Welcome to our simulated online service. My name's John. That's where you say your name. I'm Christy, John's wife. There you go. Uh, And we are just here just to kind of kick things off this morning. We're so excited that you have joined us, however it is that you have joined us, whether that's uh, on Facebook Live or YouTube or however you're watching this, around the world... The world. The world is now seeing this. We are so grateful that you have joined us this morning. Uh, And as we do this, there are a number of ways that you can connect with uh, with our community, right? Uh, If you are on Facebook Live right now, which uh, hopefully a number of you guys are, uh, there's a comment section, and you can sit there and you can uh, interact with one another. You can share some encouraging things, or maybe something that stood out to you in the service. Uh, Just something that you want to respond to. Now, Christy. There is also uh, this little feature where you can like something. Mm -hmm. So if we say something that you like, uh, you can like it, or you can heart it, or you can get angry at it, or you can shocking face wow it, or there's one other one that I'm forgetting. Oh, sad, if you're sad. Um, So this is what we're going to do. We're going to give that a try. I need everyone to hit one of those five options right now. you got to hit them, right? So... Uh, You can do it whenever, right? But we're just going to, on the count of three, we're just going to start liking things. Just for funsies, just so you get the hang of it, so that you know it's there. Ready? So Preferably not to the angry face. Well, you know, maybe you are. You're angry. Oh, here's the deal. I just want you to try that right now. Ready? Go. Are you doing it? I don't know. We don't know. Simulated live means that we don't actually know, but we're going to say that you did. Uh, And so good job for making that happen. Uh, just, hey, it's one way that you are able to interact with us here this morning uh, as we gather uh, to worship as the Discovery community around the world. Now, Christy, yes. tell us a little bit about life under the stay-at-home order. Well, you know, day by day is good. Working from home, you're mostly working from mm-hmm. home, but you know, coming Except to for church now when, I'm when we're here. here. <laughs> um, we just started watching this new series on Netflix called... The Earth at Night or something along those lines. And it's really fascinating. I love all those, like, documentaries about nature and different things. And so, you know, the other night we were sitting there watching them together. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the first episode. And um, partway through, a bunch of rhinos come to this watering hole. And um, the narrator comes on and says, purely, these rhinos are solitary creatures. And you can tell that they're really uncomfortable in each other's presence here at the watering hole. (laughs) And as we're sitting there... I hear this little voice, which is normally a big voice, but I hear this little voice come from across the living room, and he goes, he, being John, says, maybe I'm a rhino. (laughs) Clearly uncomfortable in other people's presences at times is how I took that. Would you agree, or what are your thoughts? Thank you for sharing our emotional laundry with the World Wide (laughs) Web as you tell that story. (laughs) Yes, apparently, I don't think it was as, like, dramatic as that. I think it was more... Well, maybe I'm a rhino. And so maybe you are learning uh, some things about yourself during this time. Uh, but there are a lot of emotions during this time as people are, are processing. Uh, you know, you are staying at home. You might be with kids. You might be with family. It might be chaotic. It might be uh, just calm and relaxing. You could be alone during this time, too, which is also really can be a challenge, can be really hard. And we do have, you know, fears and hopes, and there's anxiety, uh, there's stresses, there's anger, there's frustration. Just about any emotion is something that you could be experiencing right now. And, you know, one of the biggest things that we can do as, as followers of Jesus and, and is to proclaim that hope, right? Uh, but more importantly is we can give any of those emotions over to God. Uh, we have the opportunity to connect with God in that way. And uh, whether you are stressed out or fearful or not even knowing where your next paycheck's going to come from, like you can give that to God and go to him in prayer. Prayer is absolutely critical right now. You can, you can turn fear into things like worship and you can turn your anxiety into prayer. It's something that you can really do in this time. And hopefully uh, as you're learning more about yourself, like being a rhino, right, you can also uh, give that over to God. So. Uh, That's what we want to do. Right now, Christy, would you just mind as we uh, turn it over to uh, just to pray this morning, and we're going to get right back to this uh, this worship service. Absolutely. Father, thank you so much for how you continue to provide during this time. Thank you so much for your unending mercy, your unending grace. May we learn from you. May we have grace during this time for ourselves and for others. May we have forgiveness and be quick to show mercy um, when we get frustrated, when we get upset. Um, Father, we know that you will continue to sustain us through this time, 
whatever that looks like. It doesn't mean that things won't be hard or scary um, or sad or depressing, but it, it does mean that you are there constantly. Uh, thank you for that gift. Thank you for who you are. Um, Father, we give this day to you. We give this service to you. Uh, may you be in our hearts and minds always. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Christy, for being a part of, of our course, service this morning. You did a good job. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we're going to welcome Miss Pat up, and she's just got some very cool things that she's going to do for all you families who have gathered around, uh, whether an iPad or phone, maybe your TV screen, uh, and just some really cool things that, that your kids would be able to do during this time. So big hand. Let's give a big hand to Miss Pat for coming on up. I don't have two hands. Oh. Yay, Pat. Yay. Many of us have things we like to make, buy, or collect, or activities that we like to spend a lot of time doing. Maybe boys and girls, you collect unicorns, or Barbies, or Lego. Maybe you'd like to spend as much time as your parents will let you on playing Minecraft or watching YouTube videos. Special collections and activities like this can be so much fun. And boys and girls, if you have a special collection or activity, would you share that with us right now by typing it in in the comments on the screen? Well, at my house, one of my favorite collections are my photo books and scrapbooks. When our boys were young, we used to go exploring and hiking, and we'd take pictures of them, and then I would place it in my photo books so that we could look back and remember all the fun times we had together as a family. Now, Mr. Jenberg has some favorite collections, too, and one of his favorite ones is his baseball cards. He seems to really get a kick out of collecting cards like of Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Ty Cobb, Brian Dozer, Joe Maurer, or Miguel Sano. He even gets together with Mr. Doug, who some of you know from Awana, and they get together and compare and share and trade their cards. Now, while collecting these things can be really fun, sometimes we end up with just too much stuff when we want the newest computer or the newest phone or the newest video games. Or maybe we want just one more stuffed animal or Lego set. And if we're not careful, we can buy and keep too much stuff so that it clutters up our rooms, our shelves, or our toy boxes. And when we want to find something, we have to go digging through everything to find the thing we want. Well, earlier this week, Miss Terry tried to help Liam decide what he should keep and what he should give away because he really didn't play with it anymore, or maybe it was even broken. Let's take a look and see what happened. All right, Liam, today we have, to, we have to declutter your room. You have way too many toys in here, and we just, we gotta get rid of something. But, but I, wanna, I wanna keep all the toys. Well, let's just, let's just go through things and see, see what things you have had too long that you're not playing with, okay? So we're gonna make a donate pile, and we're gonna make a keep pile. We're gonna donate things to kids that maybe don't have those toys, okay? that will play with them more than you, all right? All right, so we got a couple things here. First of all, oh, what about this? Text from dad. Give me just a sec. Let me call. Text dad back. What happened to our donate pile? Yeah. Does anything like that happen at your house? I know it does at mine. Are there things you really don't need anymore, but you just can't give up or part with? These things can become a problem when they take so much of our time and energy and we put more importance on those things than having a relationship with God. Today, Pastor Art is gonna talk about where our treasures lie. Are the things around us more important? Or is God, spending time with God and loving him and serving him and others more important? Just like we have to clean out our rooms and get rid of stuff that's cluttering it up and getting in the way of us enjoying those things, Sometimes we need to take a look and see what's cluttering up our lives and keeping us from following Jesus with our whole heart. Let's make sure that we're putting our time and our energy in, in storing up treasures in heaven, not just here on earth. 
Now let's enjoy singing and worshiping as Sue and Barry come to lead us. Thank you, Sue and Barry, for leading us in worship. It's one of those really awesome things that we get to have here at Discovery is Sue and Barry. If you want, you can just like give them all the hearts in the world right now. You can just do that. Let's just show them some love. Uh, the Mustang family, thanks for all your hard work in making that happen. We do know that this is a very difficult time for some people. Uh, and we are extremely grateful for those of you who have remained faithful in giving. It's always encouraging to know that even though we're not meeting here uh, on a Sunday morning, you guys continue to send in checks through the mail. Uh, you're also doing things with push pay and all of that. Uh, we do know that uh, there are some resources out there for you uh, to be able just to connect with us that way. Uh, one of those is our text line. You can text the number or the letters DCMN to the number 77977. Uh, you can also go to our website. You'll see that text line as well as just a way that you can give there. Uh, you can do it through our app. There are a number of ways that you guys can give 
And you've been so faithful in that. We're so grateful as a staff, as a community, to be able to uh, really share the gospel with the world around us and continue to be able to do what we're doing right now. So at this time, we're going to just pray uh, for this offering. A great way for you to uh, pull out your phones and just you can give that way or however it is you give. You can write out a check, however it is. Uh, We just want to uh, pray for God to use this to do incredible things. So would you pray with me? Uh, Jesus, we know that this is a difficult time for some people. It's actually a difficult time for a lot of people. God, but your hope is bigger than all of that. Uh, God, we're grateful for the folks who are continuing to give uh, to your mission, to your kingdom. God, and we just pray for this offering right now that you will use it to do incredible things. For the gospel to be proclaimed worldwide as this is just distributed out on the web. God, will you continue to be at work in our lives, and may we never, re- never, never forget the hope that comes from you. God, we're grateful that we even have the opportunity to be able to give to you now. Will you use this to do incredible things? Amen. <laughs> Bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Where grace is found is where you are. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. again, Sue and Barry, for being able to just lead us in worship, being able to express what many of us are feeling right now. Lord, I need you. Let's just bow and let him know that as we pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that um, 
even as we're gathered in many different places today, that your presence is able to be with us, to be able to encourage us, uh, to be able to meet us at those points of need where we realize that uh, we really have had life reduced to where we're able to see and sense what really, truly matters. And so without apology, Jesus, today we want you to know, Lord, I need you. We really need you. Come in and uh, take your place uh, on the throne of our hearts. We willingly yield that to you, that we might be your people for this time, uh, being able to live as you have uh, always designed that we should be living, uh, to be able to be salt and light, and to be able to point people to the hope that is available as we love you and as we live for you. And so, Jesus, we ask this in your name as our Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. It's springtime. Do you like the yellow? It uh, helps me to think of spring. It is uh, one of those colors I'm anticipating. But it's also the time of year uh, when much of the nation uh, goes on flood watch. Uh, this year, it looks like in this area, we're, we're being spared. The melt has taken place, and it's, uh, it's been fairly calm for us. But in many parts of the nation, as the snow melts and as the spring rains fall, uh, the great rivers that are found here in the midsection of the country, they rise above their banks, and, and they flood large sections of land as the levees fail. Uh, the Red River is notorious here in this part of the world. It forms the border between Minnesota and North Dakota. It's a perennial problem area for high water. Now, most of us have a vantage point that allows us to witness the devastation that takes place from a safe, uh, kind of a detached distance almost. But if you live anywhere near the river, the danger of that devastation coming, it's part of your life as you listen to the forecast uh, you keep an eye on the river. You make sure that the sandbags are ready to be able to put in place. When events of such magnitude occur, emergency measures are required. As the water rises, it's no longer a time for business as usual or even making uh, some minor adjustments along the way. People must be warned. Barriers must be put in place. Uh, volunteers are rallied. Uh, people have to be warned that danger is ahead. Anything and everything that can be done, it's done to be able to stem the tide of the flood. Survival skills, survival skills are mandatory. I'm sure you would agree that right now, this uh, time of life that we're experiencing, when the flow of devastating circumstances, it's on the news every day, the devastating circumstances in our nation, uh, it's jumped the normal riverbed. It's rising at alarming rates. And the news just floods in on us. I'm not talking just about the coronavirus. But the trauma that's involved there, it has certainly strengthened our combined resolve to be able to respond to the threat. And at least we're being congratulated for doing it well. But even before this crisis happened, the rise of evil, the rise of evil was discernible when compared to markers as we look back, revealing the levels of previous years. One could almost uh, be blind to be unaware. You'd have to be blind to be unaware of how perilously close we are to flood conditions in our land today. So the same urgency with which we've been responding to COVID-19, to the pandemic, it needs to be applied to the flood conditions of moral compromise, of a potential societal breakdown. The water has been rising fast, and it's time to think about survival techniques. I'm not saying that good has vanished. We've seen so much good in the midst of uh, what's been taking place right now. There are still good, virtuous people 
who are ready to help and to do anything that's necessary. So there is that silver lining around the dark clouds of desperation that we are experiencing. However, just as we are seeing that the previous health policies left us unprepared for something of this magnitude, when you compare life now with the past several decades, when you look back, you're forced to conclude this is no longer a time to continue traditional policies of containment. A stronger response is required. Now, ministers are often accused, and I would say often fairly, of exaggerating the problems, uh, creating a false sense of urgency. So I'm going to try to just uh, spell some of this out as calmly as I can, describe the rising floodwaters that threaten without being overly dramatic. I found this. Sin costs consumers billions of dollars in higher prices because of shoplifting, identity theft, security devices, protective insurance, and all of the rest that's involved with that. Charitable giving in our country totals about $400 billion a year. But the cost of illegal drug trafficking is estimated at over $1 trillion. Uh, three times the amount. Uh, much of the mu music, movies, and media, uh, when you look at them, they're really, uh, they're not much better than garbage. Uh, people have become so accustomed to social atrocities in our land that we can talk dry-eyed about matters such as the disappearance of children, uh, incest, uh, ritualistic abuse, school terrorism, abortion, and so on. I'll stop. Uh, the problems speak for themselves. So let me pose a question. When, when will these floodwaters recede? Now, I know the answer. I know the answer. May I have your permission? Well, you're not here to give me permission or not, so I'm going to give you the answer. Here is the answer. The floodwaters will begin to recede when God's people realize the waters are rising faster than predicted and that it's time to adopt emergency measures. The church alone, the church alone has the resources to stem the destructive tide of evil. It's not government or education or business or entertainment where the solution is found. What is needed is a commitment that will be as awesome in its holiness as the culture is in its perverseness. The movement on the side of evil requires an equal and a greater response by the forces of good. This is what I mean by learning survival skills. It's more than just hanging on by our fingernails and trying to somehow make it through. It's responding to the call for purposeful, for purpose-filled Christian living during this pivotal movement that we have in, moment we have in history right now. We're going to look today at the survival skill of downscaling. It's impossible to avoid the media reports offering advice on how we should survive the current economic crisis, the chaos that's there. Uh, one recent article I found, it says the current crisis is going to forever change how we as Americans live. Uh, people are going to downscale, and the uh, assumption is that they're going to be looking to leave the crowded cities uh, to be able to move out into smaller cities and into rural areas as they seek safety. Safety is going to be the priority. Americans then are not only receptive to this idea of downscaling, they're willing to do it right now. And maybe you're finding yourself in the same place where you're reassessing life, a life as you used to know it, trying to determine how you're going to emerge on the other end. If we emerge on the other side and our normal is what it used to be, then we've really, we've really not taken advantage of this opportunity that we have in the midst of crisis to be able to assess, to reevaluate, and to come out on the other side, on the other end, where normal is something new, something healthier. And so, as Americans, this opens the door to us as God's people here in our country to highlight the characteristic of single-mindedness, the single-mindedness that is necessary to be able to downscale for better living. 
There are two passages that uh, we're going to highlight today that speak to this single-mindedness that is needed. The first is Matthew 6, uh, 19 to 24, and then uh, 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. Uh, the one in Matthew, it tells us that no one can serve two masters. You have to decide which master it is you'll serve. Uh, the second passage in 2 Timothy, it gives us the principle, a good soldier, to be a good soldier you don't get entangled in civilian matters. So let me read the passage from Matthew 6 that comes in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus is talking there. And he begins with uh, these words that may have a little extra punch to them right now. Uh, even though maybe you received your uh, little emergency payment this week, uh, we still recognize how timely these words are today. Uh, Jesus says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust, rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. And then he makes this point. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. It's a good opportunity for us to be able to evaluate where our hearts actually are. Uh, Jesus continues, he says, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. And then again, this principle that maybe we'll hear with ears that truly can hear better right now. No one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. No one can serve two masters. It's a concept with which most of us are familiar. But take a fresh look at it again. Jesus says to his followers, he says, your eye is like a lamp. It's a lamp that provides light for the body, and when your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. Uh, the word for good in this, uh, it means sincere, and it mean, or it means single. And so there's an obvious contrast that Jesus is making, that he's establishing here. Having a good or a single eye is contrasted with serving two masters. A person lives best while serving only one master and being motivated by one primary goal. James, in his little book, his letter, he highlighted the opposite when he wrote about the double-minded man being unstable in all he does. Uh, the challenge that Jesus offers to his followers, it's really pretty simple. Uh, the evaluation that he makes, it's better. Lifestyle comes by, the better lifestyle comes by serving one master master. I kind of stumbled over that, so let me make that clear again. The challenge that Jesus offers to us as his followers, it is a simpler lifestyle and by his evaluation, better. That lifestyle that comes by serving one master and being devoted there with a single-minded devotion. It's impossible to serve two masters at the same time. Uh, Jesus says that we're going to grow to hate one or the other. And if you've ever held two jobs at the same time, uh, you may understand just a little bit of what Jesus is saying here. Both jobs want your full attention. Both jobs require your full attention. They may even try to demand your full attention. And you can't give full attention to either one, but one is going to receive the greater attention and the other it's going to become maybe a nuisance at best where you try to fit it in and make the best of it. The masters may change, but they're always going to be unbending. And so the challenge that Jesus makes, it's the toughest one. We have to choose whether or not God is going to have our full attention or if we're going to be drawn towards serving other masters Masters that are temporary, where our physical existence may depend on them. And number one among those, Jesus says, is money. God or money, which will have that single-minded attention. 
The second characteristic is the single-mindedness of a, a soldier that's given to us in 2 Timothy 2, uh, 3 and 4. Endure suffering along with me. Paul is writing here to Timothy, and Paul has known suffering. He's getting Timothy ready for what it means to really be a, a follower of Jesus, but also to serve in, in ministry, especially as it was known there in that first century world. He says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. There are different metaphors that are used in this one of being a soldier. It's an important one as uh, we uh, are in God's army serving him. Soldiers, Paul writes, don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. So Paul presents the same challenge as Jesus did. He uses this familiar metaphor of, mili of military, and he compares the Christian life with spiritual warfare, and he makes this point, soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life. Uh, that Greek word uh, translated tied up, it's an important one here in this passage. Its literal meaning is entangled. It's used in ancient literature of a sheep, a sheep whose wool is caught in thorns. And the word is used only one other place in the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 2. We read there, when people, and when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. Now here, the word is used of one who slides back into the previous uh, sinful lifestyle. The old word that was commonly used was a backslider. And you become entangled again in the corruption of the world. Uh, to be entangled is to be so completely intertwined, to be ensnared, that it makes it difficult to separate, and it leaves you enslaved. And so Paul says a good soldier doesn't get entangled in civilian affairs, uh, the everyday transactions of life. There is a single devotion to being able to please the commanding officer. Now, Paul didn't see these matters, these, the, these competing matters, as being really either good or bad. They were bad only in the sense that the soldier could become entangled in them and end up losing the battle because of divided attention, a, a split focus. In his commentary on 2 Timothy, Warren Wearsby tells the story of a soldier who joined the army to be able to fight for his country. As they were there uh, in the barracks, other soldiers discovered he could repair watches. Soon, everyone was bringing him watches to fix. And so the day came when the bugle sounded, uh, summoning soldiers to go to battle, and the young soldier was heard commenting, I can't go right now. I still have 12 watches to repair. That describes the predicament of many of us as believers today. We're often called to do the best thing, but we can't respond because we become entangled with the good. One of the greatest challenges that we face is not choosing between what's good and what's evil, but it's choosing between what's good and what's best, what God is calling us to do, how God really wants to use it. And so we have to be careful not to become so busy doing the good that we miss what's best. Our focus has to be on what's doing our best so that we can respond to our commanding officer and please him with what we do. And so our trait, our survival skill of single-mindedness helps to move us toward downscaling so we can have a clearer focus. To avoid becoming entangled, we need to downscale. Uh, downscaling has become something of a buzzword in our society. It's really relevant to our consideration right now. When you look at the word, it's actually an oxymoron. How do you downscale? When you scale something, you climb up it. Therefore, when you downscale, it means that you climb down. Uh, in the spiritual realm, it's climbing down 
in order to soar to new heights. It's taking off anything and everything that keeps God from fulfilling his greatest purpose in your life. It's a challenge that we need to face. And due to this unprecedented time in history, like never before, we have the opportunity, the clear opportunity to face it. Uh, Consider the testimony of this man. He writes, you know, I really don't need more things. I have incredible golf clubs I hardly ever use. I like the golf, but I just don't get around to it because I don't have the time. I have a nice pair of binoculars. I enjoy bird watching, but I hardly ever do it because I don't have the time. I have some wonderful books. Some of them are worth reading twice, but they're never read. I really don't need more stuff. My house is jammed with things as it is, all kinds of gadgets that I don't use because I don't have the time. I don't need more. What I need to do is simplify my life and downscale. Now, television shows are made about this. You see the the people who go into the hoarder houses and they bring all this stuff out and they have to decide. Marie Kondo, Marie Kondo is making a fortune by helping people tidy up. James, I mentioned him earlier, he, he's told us that a double-minded person, a double-minded person is unstable in every way in James 1.8. Double-mindedness results in instability. Uh, instability is wavering, it's being unreliable. Uh, You probably know someone like that. You know that person where the tasks are never completed, uh, where the promises are never kept. Now, if we were all here in this worship center, I'd be seeing the elbows nudge different people. Uh, Maybe the looks are being kind of thrown around uh, wherever you're watching this right now. You know, they don't intentionally lie. They're simply overcommitted with divided loyalties and they're unreliable. Uh, Pursue this a little further with me. Uh, There are going to be times when we suffer from immobility. For example, if God were to call you, if you sense God calling you to go into missions, how long would it take you to be ready to be able to respond to that call? Most mission organizations, you can't serve there until you're out of debt. Uh, For some of you, that might be very easy. You could say, tomorrow, if God called, I'd be ready to go. For others, it might be almost impossible to be in a place because you are really entangled right now in the affairs of life. So downscaling, downscaling acknowledges that we can do better with less and that life can be more meaningful when we live with a single-mindedness that looks to please the master or respond to the commanding officer. No one can serve two masters. No one serving as a soldier becomes entangled in civilian affairs. So what is this focus on downscaling saying to you? Is there an attraction uh, to getting off the treadmill? Uh, to really starting to notice uh, the people with whom you live and the people that you love. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe right now you're going, you know, I've had a lot of that the last four or five weeks. I'd kind of like to get back to work. But maybe there is something there to noticing those people with whom you live and love and there are some priorities that need to change. Well, what about shifting your emphasis from accumulating material goods to doing what Jesus said to actually lay up treasure in heaven? Can you challenge the idea of bigger and better uh, by discovering contentment in the Lord's provision as he tells us to pray uh, for the daily bread, for his daily provision of the needs that we have? Could you find that there is as much joy in giving things away as there is in accumulating them? Might you begin to experience a new freedom to live more simply where you could start by saying, I was going to buy that, but now I won't. And have that give you as much joy, immediate joy, as you know it will provide long-range satisfaction when you're not suffering from buyer's remorse. 
is downscaling an appropriate survival skill for you to work on right now in this changing and challenging time. I want to give you a little prescription for downscaling. Take uh, three pieces of blank paper. Uh, my pieces were blank until just a little earlier. I uh, spent some time in my office uh, where I wrote on this piece of paper, for example, I put time at the top of this page. I, I put ministry at the top of this page. And I put uh, some dollar signs at the top of this page. What we could do, I would, just uh, as you take this, in the area of time usage. Uh, time usage, as we move forward to a single-mindedness and use of time, we'd be considering areas like this. It might be work, school, sleep, recreation, family. You, you could make them. You could make them in a list like this. I've actually found it more helpful to me uh, to be able to, oh, I'm working on time, not money. Well, well, you'll be able to get the money later. But to be able to draw a circle and to begin to segment these areas out and begin to realize that uh, when you have a much larger portion here of your scale to where it's like, like a tire and if it begins to bulge out on one side, if you get a bulge on one side, it's going to really begin to pull on the other side and you're going to feel the tension as you have your priorities perhaps out of shape and it begins to pull on you and you feel the pressure. So you can be able to do that where you can do time usage. On a second sheet, you might list your involvements in ministry, uh, the way that you're involved in ministry right now. Uh, that's the, the next slide, I think, that uh, comes here, where you may be involved in some different ways. You notice these are all good ways to be involved. But it may be that during this time, God can use this time to help you reevaluate where is the place where you, where God would want to use you to make the greatest impact for his kingdom? Where is it that you could make the biggest difference in the lives of other people? For them to be able to hear and respond to the call of God on their lives. Uh, this is an opportunity to be able to look at that and to be able to see how that might uh, go on. A uh, third area is the area of money usage. And money is one where uh, you might actually be having to have this uh, at least mental discussion right now where you're having to make some decisions on what's really necessary and what's not. Uh, but it may be a time right now to be able to evaluate, to reevaluate how you do this. Uh, b to be able to look at these and being able to say, how much of this do I spend on trying to impress other people uh, when I make my choices? So as you go with this, uh, being free from that need to impress, uh, learning to distinguish between wants and needs and really do something about it, there are the first steps there on the place to being able to downscale. And there might be other steps that you could discover, you know, where you could empty your life of adult toys that you don't need, where you could uh, give away good but unused possessions where someone else would be able to use those and actually just give them away to someone who could use them, uh, to be able to invest your time in ways that really makes a difference. Uh, there's also an exercise that's going to help you maybe go a little deeper on that area of money. Uh, it's uh, been uh, sent out to our church email list. It's a survival skill. It says survival skill number two, uh, downscaling for better living. Our first one we did back on Palm Sunday. It was making sure that we're following the right leader. It gives you five different categories where you can identify your current status in life. And then there are some downscaling activities that you could do together, uh, general ones uh, for everyone. And then there are some that are there, especially, say, if you were to say, I'm in category three, I'm managing reasonable debt. There will be a couple of uh, specific activities if you've put yourself there. Uh, there are different ones uh, if you're well off and you don't really notice any problems right now. Or the fifth category where you're in serious trouble and you're way over your head. Uh, some things that you can do to be able to use this time right now so that as we emerge from this time eventually, we're going to be able to say that the way I'm living now, God used the challenging time to talk with me, to deal with me, and I'm making some changes so that I can please my master, 
so that I can listen to my commanding officer and I can respond to Jesus' clear call upon my life and serve him with a single-mindedness that I've never known before. Because when we downscale, we climb down in, in order to be able to serve at our maximum capacity. We sell out to the one and only master. Now, Jesus often challenged those that he loved to downscale. In one dramatic encounter in the Gospel of Mark, there's a young man who comes seeking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Mark tells us that Jesus loved that young man. The sincerity of his question. Jesus uh, tells this young man because he knows the stumbling block that exists in his life. It may not be your stumbling block, but it was his. He told this young man, what you need to do is you need to sell everything you have, give the proceeds to the poor, and then come follow me. He was asking for single-mindedness on his part. If he would do that, Jesus said he would have treasure in heaven. So Jesus really put his finger on the place in that man's heart where that was needed. For you, it may be something different. It may be your time. It may be how you serve Jesus in ministry. Allow him to point to those areas where your heart has become entangled so much that like this young man, he refused to do what Jesus asked. And he walked away, and we're told, he walked away sad. He had an opportunity. He didn't follow through. So if you're sensing that Jesus has a similar word for you, and you're wondering if Jesus truly understands what it is he's talking to you about, what he's asking you to do, I'm going to close by just asking you to consider these incredible words that describe the downscaling that he did. I'm going to read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 from the message. The words are there for you to be able to look at. Listen to these words with the Spirit of God speaking to you. Think of yourselves the way Jesus Christ thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human, and having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that. A crucifixion. A crucifixion. Jesus sets the example. And his example, it far exceeds anything that he asks of us. That should put things into perspective. To desire that kind of single-mindedness where we know the master and we serve him. We know who our commanding officer is and we listen for his voice so that we will be ready to respond. I'm going to close by praying now. After that, Judy is going to uh, play for you again. And the song she's going to be playing for you today is a familiar one to many of us uh, who've had maybe more years than some of the rest of you in church. It's that great hymn, I'd rather have Jesus. Where would I rather have Jesus? I'd rather have 
Jesus than anything. Let him talk to you as I pray and as she plays. Lord Jesus, you have asked for that position, being master of our souls. Everything that entangles, all that causes our focus to become divided, that keeps us from having that single-minded devotion. God, call us back to that today. Father, I'm going to go so far as to thank you for what's taking place right now in our world. Because never before has your church, well, there may have been one time with all of the persecution that takes place at different times in history, where we have to decide at a cost of will I live or not. But right now with what's going on, we have a time to be able to evaluate just how we should be living for you. If there's anything that keeps you from having that place of being master, God, help us to come to that place where we're willing to surrender it. Because you are the commanding officer. Uh, We are signed on to serve in your army. And we want to be ready when your voice gives that command to be ready to respond, to be ready to obey, to be ready to serve. Jesus, indeed, I'd rather have you. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. That is my dedication, my commitment to you today. And it is in your name, Jesus, as the master of our souls and as the commanding officer in the army that where we serve that we pray. Amen. I'd rather have Jesus. God bless you.